Welcome to the third video in my series to overhaul a Fender Baseman 10. The owner wants it repaired and up to electrical specification because he wants to use it for several more years to come. So one of the next things I need to do is actually do a voltage survey and some current measurements of the amp as it exists today. So I wanted to put a dummy load on the back side of that, that amp head just to keep it quiet while I'm looking at things and then it occurred to me I need to know what the load is on the amp as represented by the four speakers which are in parallel in a box. I'm concerned that the published impedance of 8 ohms nominal is going to be different than what the amp head is actually seeing with the speakers in the cabinet. And in fact, it is different, and it makes a difference in determining what the dummy load should be. So, whether you're working on a Fender Bassman or any other amp, or you're working on speakers for a stereo system, you have multiple speakers in a box, this is the video you want to see. I took a lot of measurements, and I want to show you some things you've probably not seen out there on the internet. I find it very hard to find an impedance curve for multiple speakers in a box that are in parallel. I have that measurement for you. So I'm going to share that with you. I'm going to show you some things I found out. But all the steps I went through, again, were made because I want to work on the amp head and I want to make sure that loads right. And what does that look like really? So today I'm going to talk about a free air calculation. You make that calculation all the time. You just don't know it's called a free air calculation. And that, uh, the, the ohms you get out of that are very really different than if you were to measure the speaker cabinet with a measurement tool that does a frequency response uh, plot. I'm going to show you that. So I want to talk about the impedance plot. What are the different components of an a, of a impedance plot so that we're we have the same definition set, we all see the same plot the same way, and when I refer to the different compounds, you understand where I am. And then I want to talk about tonal quality a little bit. What, the, what influences that box have, or the walls in the room when you're playing have on that amp. I want to talk about that just briefly. I want to show you that a speaker is a complex high order filter. So if you want to know a little bit more about high order filters, I have my series on tone stack concepts and various tone stacks. The calculations are all the same. This time though, I, we have to consider the inductor, the coil for the speaker. Other than that, everything's about the same, whether the speakers are in series or in parallel and how you treat it for the box. And then the filter box, what you don't know is that it is also a complex high order filter. I'm going to describe that just briefly. I'm not going to go into any calculations for that because quite frankly we don't have time. I don't have the patience and it, it just doesn't matter. We can measure that instead. Free air measurements, reflex box measurements, phase plots, the free air measurement of all speakers in parallel outside the box is an important measurement to make and it verifies for you what the nominal impedance is for the speaker cabinet that the manufacturers publish. That's the figure you see on the specification plate. You don't see what you're about to measure. And then finally, I'm going to discuss about some of the things you need to understand about a dummy load for testing. So let's start. Free air calculation. Your speakers, in this case I have four speakers in parallel as shown in the figure above. What you're seeing are four resistors. Basically, a resistor has ohms and pins is ohms. You get four of those put together. And then it, there's the equation. If you have four 8 ohm speakers, you have a resistive load of 2 ohms. If you have four 16 ohm speakers in parallel, you have a resistive load of 4 ohms. You have four 32s. As in the case of the Fender Baseman, you have an 8 ohm resistive load. Resistive load, not impedance. Those resistors in this calculation act as resistive loads, not reactive loads. 
Therefore, I call this a free air calculation. Now then, for AC calculations, the resistive load is based on impedance, based on amplitude, phase angle, and the frequency at that point, and the filter order. That becomes extremely complex. And when faced looking at that consideration, no one wants to go through the tone stack calculation for a speaker or speaker cabinet. So basically they go, forget about it. Let's see, I'm going back to that equation there. I put my resistive loads in. It's 8 ohms. I'm happy. No, you're not. That is not what the amp head is going to see, and I'm going to talk about that throughout this video. I'm going to show you. Now then, let's look at a, uh, an impedance plot. Characteristically, on the left, between 30 and 80 hertz, you have, back, that's an area of back EMF, or electric motive force. That is where the speaker goes into resonance. And with that, everything's in sync. It's sort of like a swing set. You push someone in a swing, and every time they come back, you, you, you push in sequence with them. You're syncing with them, and you can make the amplitude go bigger and bigger and bigger. They swing higher and higher. The speaker does the same thing. At resonance, it naturally wants to vibrate or oscillate. So that is an important part of an impedance plot. On the right, which you typically won't see, because there, there are very few plots out there, that as you get up around 20,000 hertz, Okay, we're dealing with a guitar amp. We don't push more than 10,000 hertz through the guitar amp. We need it, but we're playing in a frequency band much narrower than that, or with it around the 30 to 400, maybe 1,000 or 2 hertz. And then it's important to have the high end part of the, the speaker there because we need the harmonics. Now then, the DC, which you measure, across the speaker, the DC ohms will be, in this case, 6 ohms in this example. Now then, it's an 8 ohm nominal speaker. That is because it not, the nominal impedance, which is somewhere between 100 and 600 hertz, that flat area of the, port of the curve, that's a nominal impedance. It's about 20% more than DC resistance. Now then, speakers are normally rated today around 400 hertz. I test at 400 hertz. That way my testing frequency and the speaker design frequency are very close and that's where I want to test all my amps or any of the work I do. It's just something I do. It's a standard I developed or I'm in sync with. Other people come up with it, I just follow suit. And then the rise and there's the impedance rise to the inductive reactance of the voice coil. What, does that make, what difference does that make with a lot of things? Well, it makes a difference here. As you approach the voice coil resonance frequency, the, the high end, those high frequencies reverberate. They reflect out into the room or back into the speaker box. And though that resonance frequency, that reflective wave, will interfere with other high frequencies. Now then, the speakers... Uh, Fundamental frequency at the low end in the base region, it could be somewhere between 30 and 80 hertz, and they will interfere with other frequencies at that low end between the 10 and say 400 hertz. In between, right around 400 hertz, that becomes a crossover frequency. Not to be confused with setting a crossover frequency for a subwoofer, which you might put down at 160 hertz. But what this it means is this. The lower frequencies will, will experience alteration due to that reflective frequency at the base, and the high end will have alteration or distortion based on our high frequency reflection at high frequency. In other words, it looks like this. If I had a 40, 40 hertz reflective wave, and it will distort an 80 hertz signal, as shown by the curve up above, the black and white curve. They distort. They, they mix together. Now then, a 40 hertz reflection will be insignificant noise on a 10,000 hertz signal. Four thousandths percent alteration of the signal. Nothing to write home about. 
but it's not a smooth, perfect sine wave either. There's noise on the signal. On the other end, a thousand hertz reflective wave will distort a ten thousand hertz. It's ten percent. Is it? Is a harmonic of the ten thousand hertz, so it will alter the wave. It will distort it. But a thousand hertz reflective reflection wave on an eighty hertz signal will be noise on top of the eighty hertz. So basically, you'll hear the eighty hertz, but there's going to be a little bit of noise on there. Let's return to this speaker diagram we for, I first showed you. Those resistors look like in the box down below. They are complex inductor capacitor resistor combinations. It's a broad band, broad pass filter. But the high pass and the low pass, it's a band pass filter. That's what this thing is. And based on those components, you can have a speaker that has a very narrow range, say 300 hertz to say 7500 hertz, or you can design the speaker to go from 10 hertz up to 22,000 hertz based on the values for the resistor, the capacitor, and the inductor. The resistor is not resistive, it's inductive as well. So all the wire that goes in a coil has a resistive load but since it's also an inductor it has an inductance loading to it as well. The capacitor is the volume of air being moved both out the front and out the back so there's a capacitive there, uh, loading there and you also have to consider the spider and other stabilizing network in the physical build of the speaker. The inductor, as obvious, that's the coil wire. Now then, to get the figure on the right, as we've seen before, you would need a circuit much like this. R1, R2, L1 creates the fundamental frequency on the left, and then the speaker, as you see, as LS, CS, and RS create either a second or third order filter, depending what you, how you treat the resistor. I tend to think of it more as inductive rather than purely resistive and it creates the voice coil resonance frequency on the right as shown. Now then, the free error calculations are shown for the circuit down below. If the, there's no other interference of a box, a wall, or anything else, they are fine. But once you put the speaker in the box, those calculations, those figures are not correct. And I'm going to show you that here in a few more slides. Now then, I'm going to oversimplify this for you, but you need to understand this. If it were just calculating the tone capability or frequency pass filter for the speaker itself, life would be a little simple. It would be complicated, but it would be simple enough. But once you put that speaker in a box, here's what happens. With a speaker out in the open, free air, what people mount the speaker on a, on a face plate and there's no box, it becomes a free air speaker or a dipole speaker because it emits sound to the front and to the back therefore you have two lobes is a dipole I'm calling that a free air speaker you're holding that speaker up in free air to do your measurement with it now then once you put it in an open back uh, cabinet it becomes a second order filter and you close the back as a third order filter and when you port it, it becomes a third, fourth order filter. And then you have to treat this filter, this filter dynamics, in with the calculation for the order of filter of the speaker, which I showed you in a previous slide. What goes into making the different orders of filters for a speaker box? Well, the reflection, uh, the surface type, uh, the batting, the box dimensions, the port dimensions, Highly complex. There are equations out there. There's a lot of math out there to do that. You can find that on the internet, but you have to go through that in combination with a speaker math and then put that math together like you would a parallel filter. In this case, you have a speaker and a box. You put it together, and then you should be able to come up and estimate a resonance or response curve for the, for the cabinet, amp cabinet. It's a lot of complex math. I just really... Why? We can measure it instead. It's much easier, a lot more fun. So that's what I've done. So in order to get the actual response curve, I just measure it. Put it together, I measure it. If you don't like it, I tweak something. So I'm, this is 
the filled the Fender Bassman 10 box. Four speakers. They call them 10 inch, but we measure uh, across the, uh, the the flange inside diameter. The flange is more like nine inches. Whatever it's called the 10 because flange to flange outside the flange is 10 inches. Whatever. The, the baffle plate is particle board. It's three quarter inch particle board. The top of the box above the speakers, not the top of the box cabinet, it's also particle board. The sides of the cabinet, top and bottom, are three quarter inch plywood. A little harder. The particle board is supposed to be dense also, but over years it tends to loosen up and becomes softer. This thing also has a support right in the middle of the baffle plate to keep that, keep the whole thing a little bit more geometrically stable and from flexing. The ports are an inch and an eighth ID. There's five of them. Here are all the dimensions. This is what I was testing today. So the rest of the calculations and the measurements I'm going to show you are based on this box. Now then, when I measured the <coughs> box, I just hooked my measuring device up to the cord that normally goes into the amp head. This is what I get. I find that the resonance frequency for the cabinet is around 33 hertz, the lower frequency. It's around 128 hertz for the box. You go, okay, so there's two peaks. That's what it's supposed to do. And then it, it rises up, but I don't go over 10,000 hertz because I don't play a bass up that high. I don't have any instruments going over 10,000 hertz. Doesn't matter. Now then, the amp should have read 6.7 ohms DC, but one of the speakers on the top right has been rebuilt and replaced it's in the same uh, magnet, it's the same basket, but someone's changed the cone, someone's changed the inductor coil also, and I suspect they changed the spider. So it's rebuilt. So it measures 7.1 ohms DC. And when I look at this, it, so the specification is 8 ohms, eight ohms nominal for the for the nominal specification, it's an 8 ohm nominal speaker, and you're going, I didn't measure that. Well, your first response is, well, gee, it seems like your measuring device is busted. Well, it's not busted. I'm going to show you why. It worked perfectly well. But what we're seeing here is the influence of the box and the porting on, the, on all four speakers being mounted in that sealed box. So, at 400 hertz, which again, what I'm interested in, it's about 15 ohms, or in that general area between 100 and you know, 600 hertz, it's about 13 ohms nominal impedance. It's what it is when it's all put together. And they claim eight. We're both right. I'm gonna show you. So I took out one of the original speakers and I measured it separately, out in free air, not in the box. I didn't hook, reach in the box and measure it. I pulled it out of the box to do my measurement. And this is what I find. It has a fundamental uh, frequency at 53 hertz. It's a great bass speaker. And it tops out at an impedance of around 150 ohms. And then there's a characteristic blip right there at about 400 hertz. I always look for the blip. It measures 26.8 ohms DC. So if you add 20% to that, it's about 32 ohms. And sure enough, when you measure that speaker, there it is, 32 ohms, nominal impedance. But at 400 hertz, it's about 40 ohms. So I took the replacement speaker out and measured it. And what I found is this. It has a much higher impedance at 87 hertz. Very different from the the original speakers. It also measures 35 ohms DC, not 26. And the nominal impedance of this is 35 ohms. So I look for my blip, the blip, the characteristic blip, I always look for when I run my plot just to make sure I have things right. It's occurring around 800 hertz. So at 40, 400 hertz, I have about 45 ohms impedance or a 35 nominal impedance ohm. Why the DC? Well, I look at it this way. I do everything based on 400. So you take 35 times 20%, I'm going to get around 42 ohms, which is about where it is at 400 hertz. So I'm okay with that. 
when I compare them and put one lay one to the other, I go, well, let's make sense of this. If I take three speakers at 40 ohms and one speaker at 45 ohms, I should read 10 ohms. I should measure 10 ohms. How do I get to that? I'm going to show you, but that is a free air calculation and a free air measurement. They will agree, as I'll show you in a few more slides. But when you consider the, the fact that the 50, there are three speakers at 53 hertz natural frequency and one at 87, and the fact that you put it in a box and the box dimensions and all the porting comes into play, then it's going to measure 15 ohms because it's in a reflective box, a reflex box. When I look at the face plots, the top left speakers, three of the speakers look what, like what's at the top left here. And then the top right speaker, as you see in, in the top right on the slide, and then when you put all the speakers and mount them in the box and measure that, here is the phase plot for a reflex box. There are a couple more changes. Again, it's because there are two uh, frequency sp uh, spikes in the lower half of the realm. Now then, I took all the speakers out to do a free air measurement of four speakers in parallel outside the box. Free air. And I measured it, again, 7.1 DC. The specification should have been 6.7. One of the speakers has been replaced. At 400 hertz, I get 11 ohms. So the nominal frequency is about 10 ohms. Sure enough, this is an 8 ohm nominally rated speaker. Not the cabinet, but when four speakers in free air gives me 10 ohms, or I'll agree, it's an 8 ohm speaker. But you put them in a box with the ports, it's 15 ohms. So, what they look like. So a free air measurement on all four speakers in parallel looks like, very much like, a single speaker when it's measured. I get about 53 hertz for all four speakers. Three of the speakers are dominant. The 87 is not dominant. It doesn't interfere with the rest of the speakers because it's not in the box uh, it's generating a reflective wave that's also in with the reflective wave for 53 hertz. It's out in the free air, there's nothing for it to bump into. So it looks very characteristically like a single speaker. Now then, unlike the single speakers, it's maxing out somewhere around 25 ohms at the, at the fundamental frequency, and then it goes on up from there. Compare that to the right. When I have all four speakers mounted in the box with the ports, it peaks uh, once at 18. Again, the fundamental frequency and the frequency of the box is at a little over 18, about mm, 20 ohms. This is the impedance plots of, a sing of four speakers in parallel on the left in free air versus four speakers in parallel mounted in the reef flex box. Very different. When I compare the phase plots, this is what it looks like. On the left, it's a little different than what you see for a single speaker. Notice on the right, rather than curving down, it tends to scoop down and then it goes off on a tangent somewhere. On the right are all four speakers in the box. I have two changes in phases and then it characteristically starts dropping off. These are the phase plots. Again, four speakers free air, four speakers in a box. Now then, for dummy load testing, what do you do? Well, you take an amp head out and you want to stick a dummy load in the back. Well, if you stick an 8 ohm dummy load in the back, that is not how the amp operates. The amp operates closer to 16 ohms, the 15.3 ohms measured but it operates at 15.3 ohms as I've shown you in the diagram up above. Resonance frequency and the box frequency and then it tailors up. However, if I'm working on this, I would probably test with the speakers mounted in the box. That makes the most sense. That could also get loud. Let's say I don't want it to be loud. I don't want to bother the neighbors. I will probably go get a 16 ohm resistive speaker. I will test at 400 hertz 
and since the amp is rated at 50 watts, I will buy a 100 watt resistor. I want it to be rated for twice the power. The reason for that is this. Typically, I test with a sine wave. So as a sine wave peaks and drops off again, the most of the power is the square root of 2 times the rated power. So it's going to be less than 50 watts. However, if I were to test with a sine wave, say I want to do some testing and understand what happens when you put a distorted signal in there. A square wave, as you know, comes up, it's on, it delivers power, full, full power, and drops off. Delivers full power for a time and drops off. And when it's up there and it's flat and it's delivering that power, there's no time for the tubes to cool off. There's no time for the transformer to cool off, and there's no time for the rectifiers to cool off, whether they're diodes or tube. So it's very hard use. You're delivering at that point 50 watts continuous to the tubes, the transformer, the rectifier, where if you're using a sine wave, it's up momentarily. So basically, 50 watts with a sine wave, you're doing less than 50 watts, 50 watts with a Square wave is continuous, 50 watts, and it will overheat. It will probably survive, but you don't want, well, it sort of depends how long you run it. So that's another way to look at it. Otherwise, I would hook up all the speakers. That's how it's going to operate anyway. That's where I want to get my voltage uh, measurements and some of the current measurements for the power tubes. I will put the, I can put a soundproof box over the cabinet, run a wire out, should dampen it down quite a bit. Not too hard to build one of those. That is an option. Or purchase an attenuator that mimics the speaker loading uh, curve as I've shown you. Now then, ideally you would like a frequency curve shown at the top there. I mean that is a reflex box curve, impedance curve. What you're going to get is what's at the bottom, a single curve, a single uh, speaker impedance curve, you're lucky to get that. Most of them will sell you that. They will sell you, uh, say, uh, whether you're going to hot plate, a hot box, uh, a Weber. If you're, if you're lucky, it will mimic a single speaker. That's good. That means as you go further down in frequency and you start hitting the 30 to 50 hertz, it's going to put more load on the back side of the amplifier and give you a true measurement as you take it for that frequency and when you go up it will also increase the load and then in the sweet spot or the nominal frequency range of 100 to 600 hertz it will be closer to 15 ohms because it is a reflex box not 8. Again there's no point putting an 8 ohm resistor or load on the back side of this amp head because it doesn't operate there. It operates a uh, nominal 15 ohms. So next video I'm going to take voltage, do the voltage test results at 400 Hertz for the Fender Basement 10 and share those with you. Thanks for watching.